Hey, good day, it's Prezzo. Welcome back to the shop today. Now, this is part two of finishing the Titan model aircraft engine. Now, there are only two episodes in this series, and by finishing, what I mean is putting some sort of decorative or protective coating on the metal parts for this engine. These are the parts we're going to be working on today. This group of parts here are all made of aluminium. Now, I've chosen to do this with an anodized finish. One reason for that is that it looks pretty. You can make it, uh, you know, one of a number of colours, but also it protects the underlying material. It will make the surface a lot tougher. It's less likely to pick up scratches and marks from abrasion and knocks and bumps and that sort of thing. And these two parts here are the uh, cylinder head for the engine and also the spinner that holds the propeller onto the crankshaft. Now with this part, I was able to bead blast down between the fins of that part and then the surface was re-machined to expose the shiny surface uh, that would have been there when I first made that part. With the spinner, this was on the engine when I test ran it and it unscrewed itself in the crankshaft a number of times and actually fell on the floor. It got dented and scratched and marked but I was able to re-machine that and bring back the original finish. Now this has been fairly highly polished but there's really no need in my experience to do that because once you've done the anodizing, you'll lose that highly polished finish and it will be slightly like a satin finish by the time it's done. Now these are all parts of the fuel tank. So this is the tank body, the end cap and the bulkhead mount that fits up against the back of the display stand. And these are parts of the fuel filling and delivery system. So again, we'll do all of those with anodizing. Now these three bolts here are made of steel. Now they're actually machined from one of these bolts here. Now this is a real aircraft engine bolt or airframe bolt. They're made of a high strength alloy steel, but they're not stainless steel. I've been able to test this, it is magnetic. It might have a certain amount of chromium or nickel in it, but certainly not. it's not a regular stainless steel. Now I polished up the head of that bolt just to see what sort of finish was on it. Because these are probably around about 20 to 30 years old and they've never corroded. So I suspect that that's had either a zinc coating on it, like a zinc plating or some sort of cadmium plating. So with these bolts here, they'll corrode over a period of time. So what I've decided to do with these is zinc plate them and put them into a blue chromate dip. Now that'll replicate the sort of finish that you would have found on a bolt like this. Now these two parts here, are copper and brass, and I could leave them like that, but they will eventually go dull after a period of time. So I'm going to do those with a nickel plate. So that's what we're doing. I'm going to get all of these parts clean now and ready to go on and we'll do the anodizing first. Now I was going to do a full video on anodizing these Titan parts and then I realized that I've already done it. So I made a playlist some time ago called Metal Finishing with Mark. There's a link up above there now. If you go and check out that playlist you'll find a video on anodizing and it's called Anodizing 101. So that's a step-by-step -step process, uh, different parts but the same procedures. So in this video, all I'm going to do is just show you a montage of the steps I went through to do the Titan parts, but I'm not going to go into a lot of detail right here and now. So the first step in any of these metal finishing processes is to make sure that your parts are absolutely clean. So I begin by putting the parts through my ultrasonic cleaner. They're in a solution of simple green, commonly available, it's easy to get. And that's really good for removing oil and grease and wax out of any of the threaded holes that are in that part. Now you've got to get the contaminants out of those threaded holes because they will leach back onto the surface and you'll end up with sort of like white rings around any of those threaded holes. From there the parts go next door into my sink and they're rinsed and then they're scrubbed. Now you can scrub it with the same product, that simple green. I've got another product called Jane Kitts Parts Wash and it basically is a, like an industrial strength detergent or an alkaline detergent. Now it does a pretty good job but as you see later on I had a problem with it. Uh, I used a simple green as well and that sort of solved my problem. From there we need to make sure the parts are hung onto a wire. Now you can use either aluminium wire or titanium wire. Now I use both. The aluminium wire is good because it's soft and you can screw it into a threaded hole just jam it in there and you can make sure that you get a good electrical contact. The titanium is good because it's springy. So you can fold it into a sort of a U-shape and jam it inside a bigger diameter hole and it will spring out and hold that part with a good electrical contact again. 
From there, they go into a bus bar. So this can be an aluminium or copper bar. It's got threaded holes and screws, and you can drive those screws and make sure they bite into the hanging wire, whatever you've used. So once again, good electrical contact is absolutely essential. It's not good enough to just simply hang the wire over the top of the bus bar. Any uh, sort of oxide will give you resistance and that's not going to be good for your anodizing. Next step goes into the anodizing bath. Now I've got a plastic tub. It's full of a chemical called sodium bisulfate. Now you can buy this at pool supply shops. It's cheaper than sulfuric acid, which is the other material you can use. It's a lot easier to get and it's safer. But sulfuric acid is generally what's used for anodizing. Now the parts are just simply lowered into the tank and connect it up to your power supply. I use uh, 15 volts DC and I usually set the power supply to about 2 to 3 amps and I let the parts take as much current as they want. The anodizing time is generally an hour to an hour and a half depending on how vigorously that part is responding. Now the cylinder head was a different grade of aluminium to all the other parts. It was 6061, all the other parts were 6011 aluminium uh, alloy and I wasn't sure whether 6061 needed a shorter time so I took it out anyway and then from there it goes into the heated dye bath. Now you can do this at room temperature, it will work, it just takes a bit longer. I usually set my temperature of the dye to about 125 degrees Fahrenheit and the part, as soon as you dip it in, you won't notice a lot happening. It generally takes about five minutes before you start to see the colour taking up in that surface. Now when it reaches the shade that you want, you take it out, rinse it, and it goes into a boiling water bath. This is the last step in the process that seals the dye into the porous coating on that aluminium part. And from then on, it's finished and it should not fade. It should be stronger and tougher, more scratch resistant, and at the end of the day, it looks pretty. <laughs> and that's what we were after. All right, this is the, the last batch of parts, and I'm not gonna lie to you, I did these three times. On the first two attempts, I got little patches where the dye wouldn't take. Not sure what the issue was, but I tried a different cleaner. I just used that simple green cleaner for all of the cleaning process on these, and that seems to have done the trick. So even though I've done this a lot, I still get failures. And the thing is not to give up. If you get a failure, just try a different technique, a different workflow. Eventually you'll get it sorted. And uh, I'm happy with these. They're absolutely blemish free. So I'll get these boiled down, they're done. And that's all the parts done. Okay, so next day, I just thought you want to see these parts up close. Uh, I've allowed these to dry overnight. Now the cylinder head turned out perfect. The colour is consistent right across that part. I've got no issues anywhere with sort of white spots or areas where the dye didn't take. So super happy with that. This part is made of 6061 aluminium alloy. I've never anodized that material before, but it was an absolute joy to do. Uh, very predictable and it worked out as good as I had wanted. You can still see the bead blasted finish down inside where the glow plug goes and in between the fins. The machine surfaces on top still show those machining marks, although you know the dye helps to mask that a bit. And instead of being super, super shiny and glossy, it's got more of a like a dull sheen to it, which actually I like. So that one turned out great. Now all of these other parts were made of 6011 aluminium. Now it reacts differently in the anodizing bath. You don't see a lot of bubbles coming off it and uh, although I've used it before, in fact for all of the anodized parts I've done I've used this material but I much prefer the 6061 now. So the spinner turned out great. Uh, this one was done a total of three times <laughs> and I know the problem now. It was the parts cleaner that I was using. When I switched to using the simple green to scrub these parts all my problems went away. So I think what's happened is that because I use that parts wash for different processes it's got contaminated with something. So I won't be able to use it for anodizing. It still seems to work okay for stuff like um, the parkerizing process. But I think in future, if I'm doing anodizing or metal plating, I'll just use that simple green. So once again, color's good. It's got that beautiful soft uh, sheen to it. It's not a high gloss finish. I can't seem to achieve that with my anodizing process at home, but I like it. 
Now the fuel tank is partly assembled and this will need to be sealed at both ends and then all the threads sealed in there as well. Uh, interestingly, when I first assembled this, I screwed the tank body home hard on this bulkhead mount here and then I drilled the hole for the fuel filler cap and it was exactly on top at the 12 o'clock position. What you'll notice now is it's offset. Now I can either leave it like that, maybe it looks intentional, I don't know, but I would prefer to have that round at the 12 o'clock position. So I think what's happened is the etching process that happens during the anodizing has reduced the size of that thread and allowed the tank body to screw on a bit further. So yeah, that's uh, something to be learned. I didn't realize that was gonna happen. But once again, color's nice and consistent, so I'm happy with that. So what we're gonna do now is go ahead and start zinc plating these little screws or bolts. So for zinc plating, it's the same process again. Uh, we're gonna put these through the ultrasonic cleaner in this simple green. There will be oil and grease in those threads there. So this will get it out and then we'll go on to manual scrubbing. This is what I use for doing my zinc plating at home here. So I've got a five litre plastic tub. I've got four litres of a zinc plating electrolyte in there that I purchased. I know you can make it yourself, but I bought this stuff. And I've got two zinc anodes, one scan which I purchased and they're hanging on the side of the bucket and they're hooked together with a loop wire. Positive of the DC power supply goes to the anodes and the negative goes to this bar on top here, copper bar. And we're gonna set the voltage at five volts. From what I understand, the voltage is irrelevant, uh, you know, within reason, between five and 12 volts is fine. It's the amperage you gotta watch. Uh, I've been advised that you just start off with the amperage low when you can see the zinc being deposited, you crank it up a little bit more and you should see a fine stream of bubbles coming off the parts. Okay, I've got each of the parts hanging on a copper wire and it's just looped around the threaded section there. It's really the head of the bolt that I want to uh, have, you know, zinc plated and this probably this end of the bolt here. So the rest in the middle is not so critical. Uh, what I did was I took the parts next door and I scrubbed those in the sink with a toothbrush and some of that simple green cleaner. And the connection between the part and this bar on top here is just hanging over the top of the bar. I wouldn't do that if I was anodizing. I'd have a screwed connection, but with zinc plating it seems to work. Okay, power supply is on. Uh, that's 350 milliamps going through those parts. And already I can see that change in color. So it only takes uh, like five minutes, 10 minutes to get a reasonably thick zinc coating. So this one in the middle here, you can sort of see there's a fine stream of bubbles coming off and they're sort of going a, like a dull gray now. Now, for some reason, I cannot get these parts to come out super, super shiny. Now I've seen people do this uh, on YouTube and the parts come out looking like chrome plate. I never get that, I don't know why. I find it's not a problem though, you can just give that a light scrub with steel wool and they will come back looking shiny. This is a part that I did, this was made of brass and that's what it looks like after you scrub that with steel wool. So that's a level of shine that I'm happy with on these parts, seems to be fine for what I do. And we're going to do another process on this when we're done, we're going to dip this in a blue chromate dip and that will give it an added level of protection. Now, again, I've already done a video on this process and it's in my playlist called Metal Finishing with Mark. I'll put a link up above there now. So if you want to see more detail about the zinc plating process, you can go there and have a look. But I'm going to give these parts about another five, maybe ten minutes, and then we'll take them out and give them a scrub, see how they look. Okay, they've had about ten minutes. And like I say, they come out looking a bit dull and a bit grey, but that's all going to go away at the next step. So I just gave them a quick rinse in some clean water, and all we need to do now is just give, give each part a bit of a scrub with the steel wool. Now of course these are a bit awkward to do but you'll see a shine starting to come up on that zinc coating. Okay they're starting to come up with that sort of a shine that I want. It's going to take a while though because these are just fiddly parts. So I'll do this off camera and then we'll go next door and we'll do the final step which is an activation and then a chromate or passivate dip. 
Okay, there's one of the bolts that I've scrubbed with the steel wool. You can see it's got that sort of a medium shine to it. And the next two steps are very, very simple. We're going to put this into a solution called Metex IT pre passivate dip. And what this does is just activates the zinc coating. And then from there, we'll rinse it. And it goes straight into the blue chromate dip or blue passivate, they sometimes call it. So just rinse that in water. And then we'll put it in the blue dip. And you leave it in there for about 30 seconds and then just hang it up to dry. Now I've also got a gold and a black dip before zinc. The gold looks a bit like cadmium, but it's a lot safer to apply. And the black just gives you that like almost like a black oxide finish that you'd see on steel parts. All right, so that's had enough time now. We're just going to hang this up to dry. We'll have a look at it later. Well, this is the last process I have to do. So I'm going to nickel plate the brass dome nut that goes on the end of the fuel tank and also the copper fuel tube that comes out of the tank. And I've got basically the same setup that I use for zinc plating. The only difference being that we now have a nickel electrolyte in the tub and I've got nickel anodes hanging off the side of the tub here. They're in stainless steel baskets. Other than that, electrically everything's the same. I do have to heat the bath though to a high temperature, about 130 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's heating up now. And I put a test part in here to see how it was going to go. Now that was a brass union nut, which is now nickel plated. So I'm satisfied everything is working correctly. So I'm going to get the other two parts and put them in. Now I'm not going to show you the prep because it's the same as what I would have done for zinc plating. So scrubbing, cleaning, and doing a water break test. So I'll get the other two parts, we'll put them in, and then we're done. All right, I've got the two parts in here, but the power is off on the power supply at the moment. So this is our copper fuel tube from here to here. I've just jammed a bit of copper wire inside it. And this is the little tiny dome nut. And I've just put a three millimeter screw in there. And actually that, even though the power's off, <laughs> that's already started to plate. Uh, that was brass. That's interesting, I didn't know that could happen. But unless there was some residual power in the power supply, but um, yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Anyway, I'm gonna turn the power on now. We'll see how we go. Well, unfortunately, you can't see what's happening underneath that green electrolyte, but it's really important you don't take the part out to inspect it and then put it back and reconnect it to the power. If you do that, you can get issues with delamination of the plated layer at a later stage. So you've got to resist the urge to have a look and just be patient. I'm going to leave it for about three to five minutes. And given that these parts are going to be indoors and probably under cover, like under a, a perspex cover or something, they're not exposed to any sort of outdoor weather conditions, so they don't need to be plated to uh, an extremely thick coating. So. Uh, They'll be done now. If I took them out now, they would be shiny and silver, but we'll just leave it a bit longer. Okay, let's have a look. So here's our fuel tube. That's looking great. And let's have a look at our little dome nut. And they're both done. So I'm going to rinse these now, and they may just need a very light buff with a soft cloth, but essentially they're completed. I'll just show you these nickel anodes that I used today. So there's five of them in a stainless steel basket and I bought these from Jane Kits. You can also buy a nickel cobalt anode. Now if you use nickel in this electrolyte, the colour that you get is more of a golden, like gold chrome, a very slight gold tint. If you use nickel cobalt, it's closer to traditional chrome plating, so it's more of a bluey bright colour. Depends what you want. I think the uh, nickel is more retro looking and slightly warmer. But if you're after that sort of uh, really, really bright chrome, use the nickel cobalt. There's a the little dome nut and it's a nice contrast against the anodizing. And there's our fuel tube. Now it'll fit in further. I've got to bend that to fit around the rod in the center of the tank. So we'll only see about half of what you can see exposed there now. And there's our three hex headed bolts. Now, where I wrap the copper wire around to hold it on the bus bar, it hasn't quite uh, made as neat a job there. There's still zinc on it, it's just contaminated a bit from the copper. But uh, it's really only this head and this very end of the bolt here that we're ever going to see. I promised I'd show you the map and I'm just updating it now before I put it back up on the wall. 
And what I do uh, when I get uh, a comment and somebody says I live in such and such around the world, I go to Google Maps and I find that location. That helps me to put the pin in the right place on the map. I'm just doing one here now called Joring in Denmark. And uh, it's on the pointy end of Denmark. So it's about there. And as you can see, uh, Europe's starting to get filled up, especially the UK. I don't think I've got any spots left in England. Uh, I've got a few in uh, Ireland, uh, up in Scotland. A few in Spain, which was really surprising. Got one in Turkey. <laughs> I couldn't believe that. Uh, I got uh, somewhere just north of Cairo in Egypt. It's utterly amazing. Uh, and I never expected to get such a response from this when I announced this on YouTube. Just, just I said I'd do it and um, all of a sudden it took off. But it's great. Uh, one of the things that I tend to do when I look on Google Maps is I just start looking at photographs and the map itself. And I'll show you a place that uh, I found extremely interesting. So down here in Argentina, there's a place called La Plata. And when I looked at this on the map, I was absolutely blown away. This is what the map looks like, and this is the layout of the city. Now you hardly ever see that in a lot of places of the world. Most uh, Australian cities are totally chaotic, and they just sort of grew up around uh, settlements and so on. But La Plata is a totally planned city, got some absolutely beautiful architecture, and that's what I like to see. So I'd start looking at the location, the geography, what the, the landscape looks like, but also the buildings because I'm really into architecture. I'm just going to do a sweep over the map here and I'll read out the names of some of the places I've added just recently. And you'll get an idea of how diverse these places are. So we've got Westgate-on-Sea in the UK, Cape Town, South Africa, Yosemite in California, Calgary, Southern Oregon, Wellington in New Zealand, uh, Werther in Germany, uh, Barry in Ontario, Macon, Georgia, uh, what else we got? Um, Mexico, Taiwan, uh, Krakow in Poland, <laughs> would you believe? Salvador in Brazil, uh, Tauranga in New Zealand, West Ukraine, Vienna, Nice, uh, Tumbarumba in New South Wales, Hokitika in the South Island of New Zealand, probably didn't pronounce that properly, Bulawayo in Zimbabwe, and the list just goes on and on and on. There was one from Berlin, Bangor in Northern Ireland. Uh, yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. So I'm just gonna do a little bit more of a sweep here, see if you can spot your pin. Now if I've missed yours, just keep at me, just keep telling me. I don't get to read all the comments, but I try to. So uh, there you go, the map is updated. Now you got some new stickers, so I'll get them up on the wall in a moment. But before I do that, do you like my new apron? I bought an apron a while ago and I showed it on the channel and it was one of those waxed canvas aprons similar to this but it was hot and it was heavy. Uh, I hated it <laughs> and I was complaining to my wife one night and I just said oh, that thing's just impossible to wear in our summer weather and she said no problem I'll make you one. So she's made this one out of a sort of a denim material. It's got a quick plastic clip in the back. It's got pockets for all of the tools that I said I wanted to carry in the workshop, including my Gerber tool and also my Bill Baggins knife. And uh, the pockets that she's put in here have got uh, leather inserts so that uh, when I put the knife blade in there, I'm not going to cut the apron. So uh, if you don't have an apron, you should think about getting one. Uh, it's made my life in the workshop so much easier because I've got all of these tools on hand. Uh, whereas before I would put something down, I'd walk away and forget about it, and then I'd spend the next 15 minutes looking for it. So I just have to train myself to put these tools back and I'm slowly getting better. Anyway, let's get these stickers up. Okay, these two here have come all the way from Tasmania. And uh, if you haven't seen Tom's channel, he's actually got two channels. So his name is Tom Wozni and he recently introduced a second channel. And he does some really, really interesting stuff, quite quirky. Uh, it's not just your regular stuff you're going to see on, on YouTube. So. Uh, Check out his channel, or both channels in fact. So this is his second channel here. And uh, Australians have this endearing habit of either lengthening people's names or shortening their names. <laughs> so Tom Wozni has become Woz. I'm sure that's what his friends call him. Uh, and that's his second channel there. So 
check him out. Uh, some interesting stuff. Here's a couple of screenshots of his uh, channel page. I'm sure you'll find something worth watching.
Well there it is guys, it's finished at last. Now I started this build in July of 2021 and it's now March of 2022 but I've enjoyed immensely working on this project. It's taught me some new skills and helped me to refine some of the skills that I already had. Now the engine's not staying with me, it's going back to California in a few days time. I'm sending it back to Roger Taylor who sent me the castings initially and I've asked Roger if he can possibly get a photo of the engine with the designer George Ginevra and possibly his son Bill. Now he's going to try to organize that for me and I want to do a follow-up video when it finally gets back to California and just show you that it did actually get there. Uh, I do believe that the Joe Martin Museum of Craftsmanship is organizing to have this put on display. They've asked me if they can sample some of the videos that I've done and they're going to have a like a super cut of the entire build series with the exhibit and then people who go along can press a button and see a shortened version of some of the build of this engine. So that totally blew me away. I wasn't expecting that at all. But if it does end up there, uh, that's, that's going to be fantastic and I, it means I'll have to go to California now to have a look at the museum. <laughs> now I didn't mention it at the time but this propeller that I've got on the engine at the moment came from uh, a person who helped me with this build. Now he supplied the fuel for the engine given me a lot of advice, uh, not just on this project, but on another project that's coming up. Now I'm going to give you a very sneak peek of that project, and you're going to see that episode next. So uh, tune in for that one, it's model engine related, but it's not a new build, it's going to be a restoration. But uh, Colin supplied this propeller, and uh, the propeller I bought for the engine originally had a very small hub on it, and it didn't match the diameter of the spinner. Now Colin went through his box of uh, used propellers and he found this one here. It was originally 13 inches in diameter, I've cut it down to 12 inches. I stripped it and refinished it and got the wood looking nice and neat and new again. It's had new tip markings put on it and I put these custom designed uh, decals on the propeller. And you'll see the same logo on the build plate at the back here. So. Uh, that was just a little bit of an afterthought which I didn't document in the original build video. So that's it. Now I'm going to sign off here now. Uh, really thank you for uh, hanging in with this build. I did get a lot of new subscribers after I started this project which was fantastic. So uh, don't abandon me now. <laughs> There's going to be other projects coming up that use uh, you know similar techniques and skills to what I've done here just with different projects that's all. So certainly uh, hang around for those and the, the other model engine related video that's coming up. So thank you very much. It's Prezo signing out now. I'm going to leave you a little montage of the, the build uh, to finish up with and uh, I'll check you on the next video. Thanks for watching.